Hello and welcome to this special episode of WQLN's Perspective, Freeway Ricky Ross. I'm your host, Marcus Atkinson. As the title suggests, we'll be speaking with former drug kingpin Freeway Rick Ross, who in the 80s moved to the top of the drug dealing chain to work directly with suppliers, including Nicaraguan drug trafficker Oscar Danilo Blandon Reyes. Blandon, in turn, used the money Ross provided him to fund his Contra rallies against the Nicaraguan Sandinista rulers. Blandon's ties to the CIA were part of the most well-known political scandals of the 80s, the Iran-Contra scandal, where the federal government allegedly pushed drugs into urban neighborhoods to fund the overthrow of the Sandinista government. Now an entrepreneur, speaker, and advocate of issues of education and literacy, Ross has written a book, Freeway Rick Ross, The Untold Autobiography. Mr. Ross, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me here. All right. So I want to start out first with this quote on the back of your book, because I think it's powerful, and this is by Dr. Boyce Watkins, who I happen to have a lot of respect for. I want to read it. It says, the story of Rick Ross is one that every American needs to hear. He is a reflection of how denied access to the American dream, a genius can be defined, a felon or a leader, a demon. Ross, his rise to the top, his struggles along the way, and his path toward redemption describe the journey of a great man who was able to find his purpose. While others might steal his name and glorify his mistakes, we should take the time to understand his path and realize, and this I thought was profound, that both the best and worst of Rick Ross were made in America. <laughs> I recommend this read for everyone. Now, that's good stuff. It is, it is. Obviously, it is. you chose to put it on the back of the book for a reason. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I got a couple good quotes out of there. You know, Bishop Jones did the foreword. He did a foreword that's it's crazy, you know. He, yeah, Noel Jones. Bishop Noel Jones, All right. yes. Uh, he did, he, his forward was just, just outstanding. It was just so many uh, great quotes and, and uh, people who have never been in that situation but mm -hmm. has dealt with it, how they understood. Mm -hmm. Give us a brief snapshot of this before we <clears throat> really start to uncover it. What is this book about and what all did it take to make it come to fruition? Well, this book is about my life from a kid. What I wanted to do was show people how a drug dealer or a drug kingpin is made. Mm -hmm. Because I believe, at one time I thought I was born to be a drug dealer, <laughs> but I later learned that that wasn't the case, that uh, I actually learned to be a drug dealer. Right. Um, and, and I think that's very important that we get that message out to our kids and let them know that uh, you're not born to sell drugs, you're not born to be a thug, a criminal, not, not, you're not born to be a lawyer, but you become a lawyer from your actions, mm -hmm. from a certain time in life that you have to start saying, you know, this is the direction I want to go in and, and, and head down that direction. Um, and that's what I did in this book. You know, I've read my fair share of movie scripts and your life, in many ways, almost reads like a movie script. They say the truth is stranger than fiction. So many twists and turns. Well, you know, I, I felt that uh, my book, my life should be a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Uh, because I've lived the life of a young black man in America. You know, I came up single family home. My mom had to work two jobs sometimes that wouldn't be around. Uh, I was right there when the Crips started in L.A., uh, lack of a good education, going to prison, uh, dealing with the government, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I've been in so many courts rooms and, and that, that I can almost tell you what goes on in courts. I've been in courts in San Diego, Los Angeles, um, Texas. Uh, Ohio, uh, Indiana. So mm -hmm. having all these experiences touch on so many different segments of our lives here in America that it relates to so many different people. And this is the narrative that plays out so often, especially with young, with young black males in inner cities across the country. This is one of the things that I personally find so fascinating. So let's really take a look at that narrative. First off, the whole lack of a father figure 
that yeah. was pivotal throughout Absolutely. your journey. Absolutely. I mean, when, when you don't have anybody who has the wisdom to say, let's go down this direction, and this is the direction that we're going down, you know. Uh, I, I just look back at my life and, and know that if I would have had somebody to take me by the hand, which a father's supposed to do right. with his son, and guide you down a path that he's determined mm -hmm. is a path that the family should be going down in order to have success. Because all kids want to be successful. Right. You know, you only lose the desire to be successful when you've been beaten down. And um, I know a lot of people try to give black men the stigma of being lazy and, and, and um, uh, with some of the other stigmas about us not. Lazy, unambitious, yeah. reckless. I mean, you can choose that a happens, host of words. That happens when you get beat down. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to college and you get an education and you can't get a job. Right. Or you're working on a job and you've been doing a great job and you get fired. Mm -hmm. um, those are the things that make you lose your ambition to make you feel that you're not going to succeed. So the father figure is missing and that plays out throughout your story. So we'll go back to the beginning. I know initially as a young person, you found tennis. A lot I of did. young people find sports to yeah. try to get out of the, the ghetto per se. You found tennis. How did that happen and what, what kind of effect did it have on your it life? It was purely by accident. You know, we were on a tennis court, rode a derby in and this guy comes up and for the first time I ever touched a tennis racket, a tennis ball, uh, didn't fall in love with it from the beginning, you know, um, but I felt that it was something that I could do, mm -hmm. you know, if I put my mind to it. And uh, later on, I did fall in love with it, uh, became a pretty good tennis player, made all city, um, but I never learned how to read or write. And that derailed my chance of going to a university playing tennis at, at a major college. Mm -hmm. And in that game, you found a male role model that you looked up to at the time. And Absolutely. at that time, it was Arthur Ashe. Absolutely. Arthur Ashe was somebody that I was fascinated with. He came down to our school, too. You know, one year we had the best black tennis team in the country. Oh, boy. And Arthur Ashe came down, and uh, I didn't get to play with him. You know, I wasn't high enough ranked on the team. Right. You, you had to be in the top four people on the team to get to actually play with him. Uh, I was in the ninth grade, uh, and I wasn't high enough on the team to get to play with Arthur Ashe, but I was in his presence. And the, 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 the karma of just him being there, right. you know. And then the guys I knew who I grew up with, they actually played, hit balls with him. So uh, that gave me even more drive and ambition to say, you know what, if Larry can hit with Arthur Ashe and I hit with Larry, then one day, I could be on that same level. So him putting that time into your school had a profound effect on you. Oh, my God. I mean, we talked about that for months, you know. Arthur Ashe came down, you know. And this is when he was number one in the world. You know, he came down to, to South Central Los Angeles, you know, took out of his time and, and, and came down to our school. It was, was, was just, you know, profound, man. It's like... Wow. I mean, kind of like sometimes these kids treat me, you know, I don't know why they, they treat me like that, but mm -hmm. um, uh, almost that same feeling of surreal. So you wanted to use this game as many young people do, especially in inner city, whether it's basketball, football, you wanted to use this game to give yourself a better life, possibly college or what have you. Yeah, well, even more than that, you know, I, I looked at it, you know, when we grew up in South Central, you know, we had windows broke out in the house. We had holes in the floor with uh, kitchen cabinets with shelves laying on the floor, you mm -hmm. know. There was a shelf supposed to be here, but it's on the bottom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, where the pipes go in, and it got big holes in it where rats come through. Right. You know, uh, roaches in the house, you know. Um, the, the kitchen sink uh, leaked, the faucet, you couldn't shut it off, you know. Uh, just to give you some descriptions of what it was like, you know, couch with holes in it, you know. And, uh, Life was hard. It was rough, man. My mom, you know, she was a gardener and a, and a maid, you know, um, a janitor, you know, same thing, really, you know. Mm -hmm. she cleaned other people's mess up, you know, if it was their house or their office, you know, same thing. And a lot of times she wouldn't be around to 
give us the supervision that uh, a kid should have. Mm -hmm. So tennis would have given you just an opportunity for a better life. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And it exposed me to a better life, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't even talk about that. Right, you know? right. Because you, you made a statement before that tennis actually helped save your life because were it not for tennis, you said you would have been involved with gangs and I'd have been a crip, things. without a doubt. I'd have been a Hoover crip. No question asked. When I was 11 and 12 years old, my goal was to get around my mama so I could become a Hoover crip. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, subsequently, though, tennis took me out of South Central, mm -hmm. you know, and I started to go places, playing tournaments and, and, and um, just hitting with people that I never would have had the opportunity to do. Mm -hmm. And it exposed me to a world that, that I desired. So there were young people that you grew up with playing tennis that actually had an opportunity to realize that and go to college for tennis and oh, things absolutely. of that Absolutely, mm absolutely. -hmm. Uh, and guys from even my neighborhood. Right. Uh, but you know, e even with them, what I noticed a difference, let me, let me say this too right up, you know, before I forget. All of my friends who played tennis too and sold drugs, who had a father, never went to prison. Mm. So that narrative of the lack of a father figure continues to play out. Now, why? I don't even know yet. Mm -hmm. I don't even know why. Because they could have, you know, and maybe should have, mm -hmm. but they didn't. Right. So I don't know how that played a role. You know, maybe the father was constantly pulling them to a series the point of interventions. where they were able to say, you know what, I made me some money. I'm good now. Right, right. Where the kid who doesn't have that structure and that support um, keep going. Mm -hmm. So with that tennis, eventually your goals of taking that any further were dashed by the fact that it was discovered that you couldn't read, you were illiterate. I was totally illiterate, had never read a book, um, never thought about reading a book. Mm -hmm. And at that time you were 12th grade when it yeah. became public knowledge. 18 years old. 18 years old. What was that like going through school without the basic ability to just put together words on a page? Well, you know, what I did is I would sit in the back of the class most of the time and um, put my head down and go to sleep and be like, what time are we going to tennis practice? You know, I lived for tennis practice. Had it not been for tennis, though, I probably wouldn't have even participated in school at all. I probably would have stopped in the ninth grade or as soon as I could get away with it through my mom, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so it did anchor you in the situation. It gave you some kind of foundation to at least be there. Right, right. If it wasn't for that, I, I didn't want to be in school. You know, I, I just, you know, once I look back at it, I just didn't see where school was going to benefit me, mm -hmm. you know. I was sitting in prison one day, right, and I was saying, because, you know, I'm in prison. I got a life sentence. And a lot of times I do a lot of time by myself. You know, mm -hmm. you're in the whole, you know, solitary confinement, no celly. You ain't going outside. You know, you're going to go get the shower for one, one time a day, um, and that's only three days a week. So you got a lot of time to yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting back and I was like, wow, what if they had been given a test in school on criminology? How well could you have done? I said, oh, I know how to rob a guy at the ATM machine. Not that I, I never did that, but the guys in my neighborhood told me about it. Mm -hmm. I knew how to steal cars. I stayed on Figueroa, the whole stroll, so I see the pimps, I know how to pimp. I know how they do it. So what I found out about school is that I couldn't equate school with none of the occupations right. that I saw was available to me. Right, it, it didn't seem to have any relevance in your world. In my world, it had no relevance. So why should I spend my time studying mm -hmm. things that are not going to be used. Mm -hmm. So you have this young man who makes his way all the way through school, all the way through 12th grade, 
never really knowing how to read. So here you are, you're out of school now. Rick Ross can't read. You start dabbling in the cocaine world. Okay, so we've had a male that had an influence on you in Arthur Ashe. Tennis was a big part of that first chapter. Yeah. Here we go with the second chapter. There was a teacher that you had a certain level of admiration and respect for. Tell us about that. Well, we, we played tennis together. Um, good dude. Good dude. He had the look, had a Cadillac, had a little jewelry, you know, dress sharp. He had some swag with it. Had some swag, <laughs> you know, and um, me and him hung out. He bought me tennis shoes before and rackets, you know, because I was poor. I, could, I didn't have rackets sometimes. You know, I could break a string and, and I'd be walking around with my head down moping. I don't know where I'm going to get my string fixed. You know, I didn't have the $12. My mom, even though she worked, we still was on welfare. Uh, this guy would help me when those situations came up. Came up. So uh, I had a lot of love and admiration for him. So when I started selling cocaine, I distanced myself from him. But this one particular day, I go and see him. We talking. And... Uh, He's asked me where I've been, and I explained to him that uh, after a while that, that I was selling drugs now. Um, and that's when he revealed to me that all the things that I saw him with didn't come from teaching. Mm. So this first model that was in your life, this Arthur Ashe image that you looked up to, and wow, he comes to the neighborhood, plays tennis with the kids. I admire his career. Second male figure comes into your world, and he has a lot that you admire. The difference is the activity that you were ashamed of turns out that he was actually involved with some of that same activity. Absolutely. Helps you take this to the next level. How so? Well, after he told me that, and, and, and I thought he was a brilliant dude, too. You know, I thought Mr. Fisher was brilliant. Uh, after that, he tells me to come by his house. So when I go by his house, he introduces me to my first Nicaraguan connection. And what I mean by that, because I meet many Nicaraguans after this first one, but they all started through this one. You know, it's like I meet him, then I meet his friend, then I meet his brother, then I meet that one's brother's mm -hmm. friend, and, and next thing you know, you know, I got 20, 30 Nicaraguan friends who are all centered around the drug business. Mm. And so from that, your activity in the drug trade just started growing, per se, started making absolutely, more money. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, now I got a real connection. You know, um, before this, I'm buying $300 worth of cocaine, mm -hmm. uh, what they call three gram, eight track. Um, but it's supposed to be three grams, and I'm probably only really getting a gram of real cocaine, or maybe even less, you know, because it got so much cut on it. Uh, well, once I start dealing with these guys, I started getting pure cocaine. Uh, they charged me a little more at first because I didn't really understand that pure and more really is cheaper. <laughs> 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 you know, if you're getting uh, three grams of cut, mm -hmm. you know, for 300, if you get three grams of real cocaine, for 450, you really got a better deal. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while to really start to equate that and and and, and uh, you know benefit from it. I think it's fascinating that with this teacher that you distanced yourself because you were ashamed. There was a bit of embarrassment. Yeah, to the course. fact that you were selling cocaine. So there was a conscience there somewhere inside of you. Oh, definitely, you knew this is not definitely, the thing. definitely, it was a conscious. And and I'm coming from the tennis world. You talking about somebody who's coming in who never drunk a beer, mm -hmm. never smoked a cigarette, never saw marijuana. So this guy is coming into a world, and and see, I drunk past the the the, the beer, the cigarettes, the alcohol. The marijuana, I'm, I'm in the cocaine. I jumped past those, you know. Right. Not like they say, you know, you, the, the gateway. The gateway. Yeah, the gateway. <laughs> it wasn't the gateway with me. You just went straight to I went straight in. Mm -hmm. You know, I went through the gate. <laughs> right. So uh, here I am, a virgin, basically. I done went all the way. You know, I'm doing the whole thing now. And, um... Which is, I'm sorry to interrupt you, which is unusual. So you didn't go from the, well, I sold a nickel bag of marijuana here and there. You didn't, you didn't start there. No, no, I started with cocaine. Mm -hmm. And with that conscience, 
I'm sure that that was tweaked a little bit as well by your relationship with your mother because she was a very Christian woman. Yes. And you knew this was something that she wouldn't approve of. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I didn't know nobody would approve of it. But once I was in, I'm into this influential group that I had never had access to. That from tennis, I craved. You know, when you play tennis, you got the doctors, the lawyers, you know, the actors, Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly used to come down and play with us as mm -hmm. well. Um, well, when I started selling cocaine, I got that same access. Mm. But now, not to the level where I was when I played tennis, now they're chasing me. Mm -hmm. So that prestige and sense of belonging, am I looking at that right? That you, that you got, did you get that from tennis that you now got from this cartel that you were involved with? Well, I didn't, I didn't get the same prestige from tennis because I was good at tennis, but the Larry, the Terry, right. the Roberts were better than me. So you had a sense of belonging, but not the prestige. With yes. this drug game, you actually started to get this prestige to go along with, in a street sense. Exactly. To go along with. Well, more with. than just a street sense, because this ain't even, it ain't even street. Mm -hmm. Drugs ain't even street yet. Cocaine wasn't street then. Right, 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 right. It's not street. Ain't no dudes on the block got no cocaine. Mm -hmm. At that time. No Crips got no cocaine. And this is about what time in history? 80? 80. Probably 80-ish. Okay. You know, beginning of 81. Um, so it gave me a prestige that I never had. Mm -hmm. I never had lawyers looking for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to look for the lawyers, you know, I used to look for the Mr. Fishers, but now, you know, after a few months, these people are looking for me now. Mm -hmm. They want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. You know, the pimps on Figueroa. Right. They want to talk to me. So go into the building of this street empire for a second. So here you are, you have this connection, you start to grow. Yes. At what point do you start adding other people to the equation? Because obviously what, your operation started to spread, not <coughs> just throughout South Central Los Angeles, but it started to spread across country. Well, my first worker was a guy by the name of Johnny Mambos. You know, I'll never forget. Uh, me and Ali partnered up. Uh, Ali was my first partner. Mm -hmm. uh, Ali was a crip at one time. Um, I used to call him Killer. You know, his name is what it is, you know. Um, and it was great to have with me because I knew that if he had my back, I didn't have to worry about when I was making sales. I used to be the one who would run up to the car and make the sale, and Ollie would be standing back with the pistol to make sure that nobody tried to do nothing to me while I was, you know, going through my rocks and putting money in my pocket. I mean, you know, I'm out on the street with $1,500, $2,000 in South Central when two thousand dollars was like a lot more than it is now yeah they would kill you over two thousand back then mm -hmm. i mean you know they'll kill you now with two thousand but i'm talking about back then you know two thousand my car cost a hundred bucks right <laughs> to kind of equate to you what what the prices was so um ollie was my partner mm -hmm. well johnny mumbles who was another crip was my first worker mm -hmm. so you grow and you grow on this this thing starts to become a legitimate street empire. You start growing into other businesses. You purchase several businesses, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Motels, junkyards, beauty salons, shoe stores, tire shops, uh, houses, apartment buildings, body mm -hmm. shops. Uh, I started to, 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 to buy businesses. Okay, so now we skipped over male influence because we went from Ash to the teacher. Before this phase of your life kicked in, that Superfly epidemic that ran across the country, you saw Superfly and it had a profound effect Man, on you, correct? I, I love Superfly, you know. Um, I kind of molded my whole strategy behind him. You know, how he was trying to get out the game. You know, how, not how he tried, he got out the game. But my goal, you know, people used to ask me, uh, well, why didn't you enjoy your money? Because all I bought with my money was businesses. You know, I was looking for a business that could sustain my lifestyle, you know, that could put me in a position to where I could uh, have money and not have to take the chances that I was taking with the drug. Mm -hmm. So to attack a very basic question that people ask often, and it may sound silly, 
for yourself, for the people that ended up working underneath you. The person outside of that world says, well, why would somebody sell drugs? The people that gravitated towards you and started working for you, why did they want to join in on what you had going on? Well, they saw my success. You know, they saw somebody accomplishing from their area, somebody who was just like them, mm -hmm. accomplishing the American dream. You know, I had cars, I had houses, uh, and, and I was doing this stuff easily. Mm -hmm. You know, buying a car to me was nothing. Buying a house was, you know, I could be just riding down the street and I see a house I want, I just buy it. You know, at this time, houses in South Central was like 70,000, 80,000. Uh, I made 200,000 profit every day. Mm. So for you, you said that school lacked social relevance for you. It did. With the people that were watching you at this time, in this neighborhood and in these areas, you gave them kind of a social relevance and you were successful at it. So, you know, I see something I want to imitate. I see it successful. So they gravitate to it. So they gravitated to it. And they felt that if I could do it, you know, they went to school with me. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them knew uh, Rick, Rick ain't the smartest kid in the class, without question. You know, even though they may have not known that I couldn't read or couldn't write, but right off the bat, they know that I didn't participate in school, mm -hmm. you know that I wasn't the smartest kid in the classroom, and they felt that if, if this person, who was not the smartest kid in the classroom, because, you know, if the smartest kid in the classroom can do it, they might say, oh, I, okay. can't, I still can't do right. it. You know, but if they can look at you and say, man, dude, he ain't no, he ain't no genius, he ain't brilliant, mm -hmm. you know, he's just like me. Right. So if he can do it, I can do it. And I think that that's what started to happen, and that just mushroomed into the whole community, saying that if Rick can do it, I can do it. So back to that conscience. So that conscience, when did it come full circle? So now it's documented. You made millions of dollars in this drug trade. When did that conscience come back and kick in and make you decide to go a different direction? Well, I'm, 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 I'm getting smart. You know, when I started selling drugs, I knew nothing about selling cocaine. I didn't know what cocaine looked like. I didn't know what it smelled like. Nothing. I didn't know how to use a scale. But now I'm a drug expert. I could open up the bag, look at the color of the powder, look at the flakes, and I could tell you what it was. You had a street degree. I had a street degree. <laughs> I could put it on the scale, I could tell you what a tenth of a gram was, what an ounce was, what a pound was, what a quarter pound was. I could do all that now. And I also started to learn about addiction, which I didn't know anything about addiction either. Um, and I found myself, you know, when I first started, I used to give my, my girlfriend cocaine. You know, here three grams. Go, 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 snort and smoke. Whatever you're gonna do, you know, give me some space. But I found myself not wanting her getting high. Mm -hmm. The reason I didn't want her getting high because I had learned what the addiction did to people. I didn't want my brothers getting high. So I started to think. Well, if you don't want your people getting high, but you're selling drugs to everybody, you're a hypocrite. And that's when I started wrestling with getting out of the business. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you fall back from the drug game. Yes. All of this Fortunately. Right. Fortunately. Fortunately. And so, unfortunately for you at that time, the feds still had their game plan because you're involved with this illegal yeah. drug trafficking. Yeah, but it was better for me to get caught from a non-active position mm -hmm. than to actively be in it and they really catch me with, mm -hmm. you know, the mother load. Right. <laughs> so I have, to, I have to put Blandon into this because I know that throughout the time that you were dealing with him in a business sense, you developed a relationship. Yeah, we did. And you... Once again, this young, impressionable person who never had that father figure, not saying per se that you looked at him as that, but... Kind of. I mean, kind of. He was, he was a mentor. He was, I mean, you know, he taught me a lot. He bought me my first money count machine. I didn't know what a money count machine was. You know, we sitting in there counting millions of dollars, and one day he come over, man, here, send a money machine on the, on the thing, and it took my business. Let me tell you this here. I used to didn't want to sell drugs because I didn't want to count the money. He solved that problem for me. He you. solved that problem for mm -hmm. me. So um, 
and he saw a lot of my problems, you know, and, and I saw the, the intelligence in him, and I admired that. Mm -hmm. So you had an affection for the man. It was a genuine, from uh, your oh, end, it was a genuine no relationship. Question. I would have never in the wildest dreams told on him mm -hmm. or, or, or did anything. You couldn't hurt him around me. I mean, this guy, I had to tell this guy, man, you can't be coming to South Central L.A. like you're doing. I mean, he would just pull up in South Central L.A. and pull up to my park. Mm -hmm. I was like, listen, man, these dudes over here kidnapped and killed. Mm -hmm. He's been to your they, home. They know you. <laughs> right. But you can't trust them. Mm -hmm. So this man has been in your home. He's been in your personal space. He's been in my personal. This is my hood. He's mm -hmm. in my hood. All right. You know, so I had gave him leeway at that time that a lot of people didn't get. Uh, and he felt real comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So Blandon was eventually your downfall. So now we have the feds, one of. Now you have the feds, and they've moved in with the case. And yeah. so much surrounding about that. Tell us briefly when the, the curtain fell. Well, Danilo called me. He's he saying that he has 700 keys of cocaine, and he stuck with him. He needs to get rid of him. And he quotes me a price, and I was like, ah, man, I ain't doing nothing. And then he goes on about, oh, I know you ain't selling, but, you know, your homies is. And he started naming some of the homies that he knew were still working that uh, may not go through him, but would come through me. And he was asking me to hook him up with him and so forth. And uh, I eventually did. And then when the little homie handed him a bag of money, mm -hmm. the feds started putting their jackets on. You know, they had the undercover jackets on, but after that they put the FBI jackets, start popping up. We start seeing FBI and DEA jackets, you know, all over the place and, you know, guns coming and it was just, it was just crazy, you know, it was, a, it was a setup. So this whole Rick Ross legacy at the time is growing like weeds. You've got, you know, you've taken over the streets in some ways as far as drug dealing, but it also gives way to a corrupt law enforcement investigation, Drew? Yeah, well, you know what? I, I, the drugs corrupted those guys and mm -hmm. the money. Uh, they, they were just like us, you know? Uh, and they should have been harder to corrupt than we are because these guys had good jobs, you know, sergeants in, in the police force, but they started being around this money. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for them not to put their hand in the cookie jar. And they went from there to wanted to get more money. So in order to get more money, they had to start for, uh, uh, forging search warrants, mm -hmm. uh, forging arrests, and, and, and uh, it, they just got crazy with it, beating people, you know. You see these scars in my face all come from while I was handcuffed, you know. I was handcuffed and beaten, and because we wouldn't open the safe, uh, they would torture you. Law enforcement officers. Yes. And all of this is chronicled in your book. It is. But this is what I love. And about on the documentary too. You and know, on the documentary. You know, I tried to get a couple of those guys. I tried to get the worst of the police to 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 come forth and talk because they all did their time. But I did get one. I did get one. Right. He, he came forward and spoke, and and I'm so thankful that he did, uh, uh, because it's really you know when you when you can just let it all out, it really relieves you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and I think that it's so important that we educate our people, you know, to what took place in the 80s and, and, and in the drug business. And that documentary <clears throat> you're making reference to was Cracks in the System. Freeway Crack in the System. There you yes. go. Yes. Okay. So with, with that, that goes back to the statement by Dr. Watkins about the, both the best and the worst of Rick Ross were made in America. So you have Rick Ross, <laughs> big drug kingpin. You have the officers that are investigating and following, 35 of them, if I'm not 35 mistaken. 35 got, got, uh, got fired, mm -hmm. I think like 13 went to prison. Okay. And so then you bring it to that, the CIA connection. When did you figure out <laughs> and when were you made aware of the fact that the CIA actually had some play in this? Man, I didn't have a clue. You know, uh, we got a call from my lawyer and he was talking about this reporter who was new Danilo and he wanted to talk to me and so forth. I, and, I, you know, my lawyer was little leery about me talking to reporters because I was looking at life sentence, but uh, I'm like, man, you already told me I I'm going to jail forever, you know, so what if I talk to a reporter, mm -hmm. you know? So I decided to talk to Gary. We came, we sit down, we spoke. Uh, but Gary didn't give me much information. Uh, it was when he published his story. Gary what? Center, yeah, it, the Ark Alliance and the San Jose Mercury News that I first learned. And, you know, he sent me a copy, uh, overnight mail, so that when it came in the newspaper that day, I had my copy. The morning when I woke up, I had my copy at my door. So uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to get it. 
before, still before most of the world got it, because um, he didn't give it to me early. I got it the day of the, that everybody got it. So um, that's when I first found out about the CIA was, and I didn't believe it though, you know, like everybody else, man, right. the CIA could stop it. This dude is, and, and even though, you know, the, the, the government tried to say I made the story up, you know, and I didn't believe the story. <laughs> right. I mean, it was. It took me a while to, um, to believe that, that the CIA, I'm like, how could I? Least likely to succeed. I guarantee you, if my class would have voted least likely to succeed, it would have been me. Right. Now, how am I dealing with the Illiterate. CIA? Illiterate. How am I dealing with the CIA? You know, um, and then it, it just got even more serene, you know. Then a couple of days later, then Bill Clinton is talking about me and my name. And How surreal is that? Oh, um, man, it was crazy. <laughs> And then the CIA director is talking about me. I mean, it just it just kept going and going and going and going. Um, and you found out more in prison because while you were in there, your cellmate, to kind of fast forward your story, encouraged you to learn how to read because you wanted him to read your deposition. My, my indictment. Your indictment. It was and, my and, indictment, and, yeah. And he said, read your own. He told and me you to couldn't. read my own, and I couldn't. Uh, he made me some cue cards, and he basically taught me how to read. Mm -hmm. You read over 300 books in prison? 300 books in prison, uh, LA Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. I read those just about every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I built me an education in there. Right. You know, I educated myself, and uh, I taught myself how to break outside of the prison walls. You know, uh, I was listening to Minister Farrakhan one time, and he talked about uh, how a baby can, if it constantly develops, the mother has to have it. And it's nothing that she can do naturally to stop from having that baby right. other than aborting. And I took that to mean that while I was in prison, that I was in the belly, mm -hmm. in a cocoon. Right. And that if I constantly develop, then that prison couldn't hold me. Right. And it got to the point to where my mind was no longer incarcerated. I mean, I would call to the streets and I would be talking to somebody on the phone and I would be feeling sorry for them. Mm -hmm. So we often encourage kids that reading opens the world to them. In a literal sense, reading opens your world Man, in prison. Like never before. Mm -hmm. I mean, living couldn't open my world the way these books did. Mm -hmm. um, I have been places inside of the prison that I never thought about going to physically. Now I want to go there physically, but mm -hmm. I had never thought about that before. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to meet father figures or mentors that I never could meet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I met billionaires. I, I met the richest man in the world, who was Sam Walton at the time. Um, I read three books on Sam Walton. You know, I knew what kind of truck he drove. I rode in the truck with him, you know, basically. Mm. When you read, you can put yourself, I learned how to put myself right in the truck with him. Right. And the guy that was writing the story, you mm. know, the guy talked about uh, Sam Walton was the richest man in the world, and Sam pulled up to the airport to get him, and he was looking for the Rolls Royce. And they walked right past the Rolls Royce, and they jumped in the old truck. And he said, in the old truck, the seat had a hole in it, and the spring was sticking up, and you had to, push the spring to the side so it don't stick you in. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you're envisioning all of this as you're reading it. I'm visualizing. Because the world has opened up to you now. Yes. So you learn to really understand and appreciate the situation that you were in at the time. The Sandinistas, the Contras, the CIA, the laws that were written that gave way to the situation. So this whole picture becomes much more clear to much you clearer. once you learn to read. Much clearer, much clearer. And my comprehension on reading was different. I mean, even then my lawyer, you know, when I found the issue to get me out of prison, mm -hmm. the whole court went against me. <laughs> I'm the only one in court saying, hey, Your Honor, you can't give me a life sentence. My lawyer, who I'd paid, you know, before 180,000, was like, no, Rick, you're not right. You're not right. The, the law don't read like that. It don't apply to you. Because they couldn't comprehend like I could. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I went to the appeals court and they said, Mr. Ross is absolutely correct. Right. You can't give a guy a life sentence as a career criminal for one day of criminal activity. Mm -hmm. If he sold to a thousand people, 
it's still only one day of activity and he can't be a career criminal in one day. Even though mine was over a, a period of time, right. it was still one criminal episode. Mm -hmm. You know, it kept going. It wasn't interrupted by arrest and conviction. So this whole thing gave way to investigation after inve investigation. You have Maxine Waters, who's now involved. Yeah. You've got John Kerry running, you know, his investigation with a committee as well. And just a lot of things. And these people coming to my cell. Right. You know, Maxine came down, the, the, the head of the OIG, the head of the CIA, the head of the sheriff department. These people are coming, talking to me now, and, and basically I'm getting more experience with dealing with people, people that I never had an opportunity to, to talk to, to deal with, to communicate with. Um, and I'm having the opportunity to communicate with a whole different level of, of, of people. I mean, you know, the CIA uh, head person from the CIA come down to, to, to talk to you and, and investigate you. They got like four people there investigate me and mm -hmm. trying to interrogate me and cross me up and, and you know tell me, well, Mr. Ross, you saying that the CIA? No, nah, I never said the CIA <laughs> sold drugs. I don't know nothing about the CIA. Right. You know, and this is what I did with Danilo Blandon though. And I know Danilo Blandon, if, if he was a CIA agent, then that's what it is. I don't know if he's a CIA agent. Uh, I just know that me and him sold a lot of cocaine together. Mm -hmm. Now, if he sold for the CIA, then those are the numbers. Mm. So, and the reporter <clears throat> that broke the story, Gary Webb, who's now, you know, he's dead now. He's, he's been gone for quite some time. He wrote his book, movies come out and everything. A lot of investigations. To pivot a little bit, you're wearing a shirt. The real Rick Ross is not a rapper. <laughs> yeah. So at some point, some guy whose will name, whose real name is William Roberts, decided to pay homage to you in, in some sort, steals your name and your persona, and is now making millions upon millions with that name and persona. When did you discover that this rapper was imitating you in this way? Well, I was sitting in my cell, and uh, I, I had a study group at the prison mm -hmm. where I was teaching young guys. I, you know what I found out about myself is that I've always been kind of like a teacher in some form or fashion. So I discovered these books. So I started teaching these young dudes out of these books that I discovered. Well, this one particular youngster who studied uh, uh, with me ran over to my cell and he had this article. It was an XXL article and he had this guy in here with his mouth open and he big gold chains on and he called himself Red Cross. And uh, that's when I first found out. And you got in touch with him? I, I got him on the phone in about a week, week and a half. Because you're a businessman. Oh, yeah. I bet you out. <laughs> so obviously your goal was, how do we rectify this? You're using my name. You're obviously making money to do it. Right. How do we rectify this? You ain't this? been down here to see me? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what's wrong with you? You mm -hmm. tripping. And it couldn't get resolved man to man. No, uh, you know, he, he, he played games. You know, uh, he told me he was going to come. I sent him the visiting forms. Uh, he never received them, and then uh, subsequently uh, his number got disconnected, and, and it cut off total ties. And uh, I had pretty much forgot about it. But when I got out of prison, uh, this lawyer approached me and was like, "They owe you money." Mm -hmm. And you know, if somebody owed me some money, I want it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in his real life, post rapping. He was William Roberts, the corrections officer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what's so ironic about the whole imagery that, <laughs> that he betrays. You know, he's telling people that he was a major drug dealer. And, you know, if you go through the screening process to be a correctional officer, you know, you can't even smoke weed. Right, it's pretty you tight. Know, you can't, I, I doubt if you can ever been drunk before. Mm -hmm. You know, they still probably won't let you have a job. So we know that he didn't sell drugs before he was a correctional officer. And then he went right from being a correctional officer into the rap business, mm -hmm. which is probably how he got hip to me is probably from somebody in prison. You know, one of the guys in there showed him an article or put him up on me or something. Um, <clears throat> he had told me that there was some guys from L.A. that had really put him up on me. But I, I think it was probably some guys in prison who, who really laced his boots. This is where I say that your life is strange and in fiction in many ways. Here you have an illiterate kid who goes all the way through 12, all the way to 12th grade, not knowing how to read. So he goes through the system. You have the same illiterate kid who now becomes a drug dealer. He's running from law enforcement. And the law enforcement is chasing him, ends up being <laughs> robbers and drug dealers in, in many ways themselves. He's running from the laws that are created by the government. That government was supplying many of the drugs that this man was selling. 
he ends up in prison, and you've got prison guards now guarding him, and a former prison guard Takes his steals name. all of that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Only in America. I ain't never thought about it like Only that. Only in America. I mean, you put it, you put it in a whole nother light. The like, truth is strange and fiction. Man, you put it in a light like I never thought about. But right. you're absolutely correct. Um, I mean, you know, even it's my life, and I still look back, and I'm fascinated sometimes of how fascinating this trip has been. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote a book, man, so everybody can see and, and feel what I went through. And, 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 you know, and young people, you know, who are contemplating getting into the drug business, they, they got a roadmap now mm -hmm. to, to make choices that are going to affect their life forever, you know, because some of the choices that I made before affects my life right now and uh, going to continue to affect my life in the future. So you took the rapper Rick Ross, William Roberts, you took him to court to try to set this thing straight. Absolutely. And you lost. I lost. Miserably. How did that happen? I don't know how the judge did that. She said that there was a statute of limitations issue, but, you know, the law says that if there's a continuous use, then there is no statute of limitation. And I've said that, well, every time he raps as Rick Ross, that's a continuous use. But she didn't interpret the law that, that way. Um, <clears throat> but you know, she used to work for Universal Music Group too, so oh. um, that may, 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 not, not necessarily, but it could have mm -hmm. had something to do with it. Uh, we talked about your time <clears throat> dealing with drugs in the 80s. And I think before when we spoke, we talked about the rise of privatized prisons and the rise of gangster rap and how parallel that runs. And you look at the drug game, people like Rick Ross are glorifying this lifestyle with their lyrics. What have you discovered about that whole connection between these type of songs and the prison industrial complex? Well, there was a letter that I came across that talked about the prison, in, I mean, uh, the record labels had figured that music was dying because of people downloading the music for free, so they were no longer able to sell CDs like they used to, which used to drive the music business. Now music is more of a promotional tool, meaning that if you have another product, you put music with it, and it turns into something that can promote that product. Well, what the record labels did is they started to take their money and invest in private prisons. So they needed a way to keep these prisons full, so what they did is they started this gangster or prison mentality that we have right now where they take somebody and make them if they're not even rich make them look rich and say that they got this money from selling drugs and that if you want to look like this if you want a record career you got to go out and sell drugs and parlay that into a record career mm -hmm. so you see people like rick ross and nwa during their rise and these there's a value placed upon that because it's almost it, it's advertisement to promote a lifestyle which in turns fills these prisons up and the numbers are well documented on this. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, with the clothes that they wear, you know, most of those kids can't afford those clothes. You know, I, I go and speak sometime at some of these high schools that I know the kids are in the projects and mm -hmm. I see these kids wearing two hundred dollar tennis shoes and, you know, shirts that cost seventy five dollars and a hundred dollars and I'm like, how can you do this living in the projects, you know? And and we should be focused more on what's in our mind than what's on the outside. Speaking <clears> of <throat> mind, you, you gave me an interesting theory as to why so many of our children, African-American children from the inner sea in particular, are not necessarily bothered by the idea of prison because right now they're kind of imprisoned in the mind. Talk about that. Well, you know, we have, we have kids in, in South Central LA that stay in the projects that stay maybe five to seven miles from the beach but have never been there. And that's because they don't leave this certain area. They have confined themselves in these areas and they have what I call invisible walls. Uh, like with me, when I was in prison, I had outgrown the fence of the prison of the penitentiary. That fence was not holding me. It was holding my physical body, but it wasn't holding my mind. My mind was all over the place. Especially after you learned to read. After I learned how to read. These kids don't have the physical fence, but they've been put with this invisible fence where their mind is incarcerated or in chains, where they can't think outside of these projects, mm -hmm. uh, this pair of tennis shoes or, or this rap song or this shirt that I'm wearing or this car that I'm driving with the paint job on it. They can't think outside of that, so that confines them 
to that particular area, that particular thing. So the book, give me some takeaways from the book. I read the book, I'm a young person, I'm whoever. What, what does a person take away when they read this? What's been the feedback from you, for you? Uh, a teacher told me one time that this book should be in every single school because it's an anti-gang book. I explain in there, and I wasn't trying to write an anti-gang book. You were just writing your story. I just wrote my story. And my story is why I never became a gang member, even though I wanted to. I wanted to be a gang member, but I didn't for a reason. And when I started selling drugs, I was glad that I'd never gang banged. Because not gangbanging allowed me to cross different gang lines that had I been a gang member, I couldn't have crossed. Mm -hmm. um, another guy one night, man, I was in a club in Houston, Texas, and this big guy, maybe like six, 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 five, four hundred pounds, maybe linebacker, or, uh, defensive end, or a guard rush behind me and grab me up and pick me up, man. He gave me the biggest bear hug. He said, "Man, thank you. You taught me the law of attraction." From that I'm book. reading that book. You know, I wrote this book, too, based off of my three favorite books, The Richest Man in Babylon, Think and Grow Rich, and As a Man Think, and because those books enabled me to go back through my life and analyze my life and document it in these books mm -hmm. and showed me how I should be analyzing everything that I come in contact with. For the naysayer, this book celebrates or glorifies your life as a drug dealer, true or false, and why? False. Uh, because in the book you will see that even though I made a lot of money selling drugs, it almost cost me my life. Um, and like I tell the kids when I go to the school, if you don't mind doing 20 years in prison, then you should go ahead and sell drugs. But if you want to be taken away from your family for 20 years, maybe even life, and you may not want to sell drugs. It's not my choice to make up, do you, should you be a drug dealer or not? It's not my choice. It's going to be your ultimate choice, but at least you should have all the facts. Mm -hmm. Did you not speak to key members of the rap community about portraying this image that our children are buying into? And if so, how did that play out? Uh, I reached out to him. Uh, I even reached out to the rapper that had my name because I thought that uh, him breaking the ice would be a big influence over the rest of the rappers, but uh, to no response, nobody, nobody reach out. I mean, you know, right now they, they, I mean, they, they, they feeling good about what they're doing, you know. And it's uh, making them a lot of money. Making them a, some money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't know how much, but right. maybe a lot. It's you making know. somebody a lot of money. It's making somebody a lot of money. All we right. don't know if they're the ones with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I did, and and um, because you know, you you find out that something that you're doing right now might not be something that you're proud of mm -hmm. five years from now. Is this your prime source of revenue right now? What, what is Freeway doing? Now, obviously, you are no longer a drug dealer. You've served your time. You're trying to serve your community. My book definitely is, is, is a major factor in, 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 my, in my source of income. Uh, you know, I have my shirts out. I do my speaking engagements, which, which you know, pays pretty well. You know, not what I'm going to get. You know, I'm cheap right now. Y'all better, better <laughs> get me now uh, before my price go up. Uh, so I, I get paid for going to colleges uh, last week, a week before last. I did two colleges in one week, first time. Uh, so so that, was, that was good. But you know, I spoke at Brown University, Stanford, uh, USC Law. Prestigious schools. Yeah, UCLA, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So I've been in some pretty strategic, oh, me and Michelle spoke at uh, St. Francis. Michelle Alexander, yeah, we the spoke, new Jim Crow. Yeah, we spoke at... Uh, St. Francis, Illinois, and in mm -hmm. Chicago, right outside of Chicago. So uh, I've been getting around, you know, doing, doing. Matter of fact, I got a university that's talking about me teaching a class. And I got a junior college that's talking about me coming there teaching entrepreneur classes mm -hmm. to guys who, and people who they feel are not motivated to go the normal route. Mm -hmm. so. Because everybody don't get taught the same. That's that street degree. Yeah. I mean, either you've, you've gone through the coursework or you haven't. And yeah. in that respect, you know, you have. So I can understand the logic behind maybe a high school in South Central, a high school in inner city Chicago for a place like Stanford. Brown, what do you think their motivation is for bringing you in? What do they get from that? Well, you know what I found out about, about these, <laughs> these white schools? Um, they want their students to have all the angles. All the information. All the information. You know, uh, the more information they give them, 
uh, the better. And, 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 and sad thing about black schools is they don't feel the same way. You know, they want their kids to have what they think they should have, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a, definitely a, a negative. Uh, you, you know, I, I've only spoke at one black college, and it wasn't even the college who brought me in. It was another program that they were having at Morehouse, and they brought me in, and, you know, it was only about 30, 40 kids in, in, in the room at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but Brown, you know, was sellout, as they say, standing room only. Uh, Louisville, it was almost standing room only, even though there's a lot of blacks at Louisville that did showed up. But um, a lot of the black schools are afraid, I think, of bringing a drug dealer on campus. Mm -hmm. That's a shame. So right now, with all of this life experience, who is Rick Ross now, and where is your life headed right now? Man, uh, who am I? Uh, I'm a, I'm a whole lot of things. Movie producer, actor, father, eight, um, brother, you know, uncle, um, community activist, philanthropist, um, teacher, learner. You know, it's just so many things that, that, that we can be in this world. You know, we can't limit ourselves to just our community or our personal thoughts of how we feel, you know, uh, one of the things that one of my favorite teachers says, which is Napoleon Hill in Think and Grow Rich, is that one of the first things that you have to do is open your mind. Mm -hmm. How does somebody get their hands on the book? All of this is in the book, and mm -hmm. how does one go about getting a copy? Well, uh, the easiest way probably would be to go to my Facebook or my Instagram, my Twitter, uh, Freeway Ricky, and uh, you can order off my website from there. Or you can go to Amazon if you have to. You, know, mm -hmm. you ain't going to get an autographed copy if you go to Amazon. If you go to my personal uh, website, I will autograph it for you. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the easiest way. Rick, thank you for coming on our show. We certainly appreciate the time, the wisdom, and the personal experiences. Thank you for having me. We're out of time right now. I'd like to thank Mr. Ross for joining us in the studio. You can find more information. Search Freeway Rick on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And... We'd like to thank you all for tuning into this program. Please continue this discussion with us. Go to our website at WQLN.org, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter at WQLN and use hashtag Freeway. For Perspective, I'm Marcus Atkinson.